hey, we're going to do something a little bit different today. So I grew up in, not grew up, but I spent some time in the 80s from 1984 till 1987 living in Romania, which at the time was behind the Iron Curtain. And this was really still at the height of the Cold War. So my dad was in the military and we, he got posted or stationed to Romania uh, working at the embassy. And so we lived life as diplomats, but we lived behind the Iron Curtain. So at the time, Romania uh, was a Soviet satellite, part of the Warsaw Pact, and was ruled by a communist dictator named Nicolae Ceausescu. So we got to you know, experience as much as you can experience it as a diplomat, but living in a communist country and seeing the despotism and, and just disgusting, morally bankrupt um, bankruptness I guess, or bankruptcy of the, you know, Soviet slash communist system. Uh, people were, you know, desperately poor. Uh, they, the state tried to create a cult of personality around this dictator. And, and, you know, for me at that time, it was transformative for a couple of reasons. One was and like in ways that still impact me to this day. One was that <clears throat> it made me super grateful, you know, to live where I live and to have been blessed but through an accident of birth to have been born in the West. Uh, and I'm not sure that I would have ever appreciated that nearly as much as I do had I not experienced the, that time in Romania. The second thing was, again, because it was at the height of the Cold War, there was so much propaganda going on from our government to us about, you know, the basically feeling like like we literally did live in some level of fear about the fact that a nuclear war could happen back then, you know, and that the Soviets were just had an itchy trigger finger and there, it was a blood ho thirsty horde of commies that needed to be, you know, held back at all costs and blah, blah, blah. And then you go over there and you realize that these people are human beings and they're kind. And despite the fact that we were fabulously wealthy to them, we're generous and welcoming and had wonderful hospitality, even though men, they weren't really allowed to talk to us. So that was really an eye-opening experience for me too, to realize that these, the quote enemy was all a construct. And it really made me wonder who benefited from creating that divisiveness. You know, it certainly wasn't me and it certainly wasn't the people of Romania. Uh, so, and also we were over there, interestingly, when Chernobyl exploded. Uh, in 1986. And we were about a thousand kilometers from where it exploded, which was, you know, in some ways not that close and in other ways, you know, way too close for comfort, especially because the Soviet Union, you know, did so much to hide the explosion and radiation was spewing all over Western Europe, which could have easily come our way. Like we didn't really know, obviously we knew had something bad had happened and there was definitely a level of concern. So my mom, you know, has really done a lot of amazing things since then, you know, helping people back in, in, uh, in, you know, some of the, you know, Belarus, for example, which was terribly impacted by Chernobyl, like just doing, I, I won't go into all the details, but just so much amazing, beautiful, selfless humanitarian work um, that again, you know, what, what was it? it is 34, 36 years later, 34 years later, maybe, you know, still, still, helping people because that's the amazing kind of person she is. So anyways, during that time, this Reader's Digest came out, the February 1985 edition, and they had this story um, called Escape from Russia on Foot. And I remember my mom loving that story. And I also remember um, how much, um, you know, that, that, that edition, I love that story too. And the edition of that Reader's Digest had been around our house for years afterwards. Um, and then eventually it got lost. Uh, so, and I was, I was thinking about it before Christmas. I was like, I'd really like to get, find it, see if I can find a copy of that. And then my, you know, read it for my mom. Cause her eyesight isn't that great. And probably reading a reader's digest at this point. I mean, it's difficult for me with my glasses. It would be basically impossible for my mom. So I thought, Hey, she loves listening to audiobooks, and maybe I'll get the book and then print it off. I can't really see it and then read it to her. So that's what I'm going to do right now. So uh, I'm certainly no audiobook um, narrator, but I'll do my best. So it's a great story. Uh, hopefully, my narr uh, my narration doesn't completely ruin it for you. But I think that what you'll find by listening to this is not only not only is it a, a great story, but it's a real testament to the power of the human spirit and how much we can push ourselves way beyond what we think our limits are. So sit back, 
enjoy the story and uh, we'll catch you on the other side and uh, Merry Christmas, mom. Escape from Russia on foot by George Pfeiffer from the 1985 February edition of the Reader's Digest. It was a simple yet audacious plan. Armed only with a backpack of provisions and equipment, the young Russian headed for his country's northwestern border. His goal, Finland, and after that, the safe haven of Sweden. His escape was borrowed by a, barred by a heavily wired Soviet fence, keen-eyed border patrols, and some of the toughest terrain in Europe. But Alexander Georgine accepted the challenge. <clears throat> Here's the story of his 23-day trek, a test of determined endurance that stretched both strength and nerve to the breaking point. The queue at Moscow's Leningradsky railway station seemed endless. It took Alexander Georgine, a 26-year-old physics and recent graduate of Mo a physicist and recent graduate of Moscow University, four hours to reach the window of the ticket office. It was August 15th, 1979, and he had just got back to the city after a hard 10-day hike with a friend in the Carpathian Mountains. Yet now, within 48 hours of his return, he was preparing for another far more demanding expedition, one that would shape the rest of his life. This gifted young man had decided to risk everything and flee his native land. He would buy a train ticket to Murmansk in the extreme northwest of the Soviet Union and then try to make his way to and across the Finnish border. At first sight, the quiet spoken Georgine did not seem the man to take such a desperate gamble. He was of medium height and average build. His mildness of manner, studious spectacles, and long fair hair suggested a certain softness of personality. Yet beneath his garb were muscles toughened from long hikes and hard physical work. His blue eyes glinted with determination, and there was something authoritative about the cut of his jaw under a recently grown beard. Only powerful conviction and an iron will could explain the decision he had taken. Yet having taken it, he felt desperately lonely. As Alexander waited at the station, he had time to reflect. It was ironic, he thought, that even the final act of fleeing the country, you had to stand in line. Just as you did for potatoes, pencils, and practically everything else in this rich country kept poor by the Soviet system. When his turn came, the bearded young man bought the cheapest sleeping accommodation to Murmansk. His train would leave in the early hours of August 19th. Alexander spent the intervening days going from one back street shop to another, buying equipment for his journey. Selling his precious physics books was a wrench, but they provided money for a flashlight, hacksaw, hip boots, fishing rod, and mosquito repellent. His ancient hiking boots and backpack would have to do. His slim budget could not afford replacements. His food supplies were skimpy, nine pounds of lard and cheese, several pounds of black bread cut thin and dried in the air, tea, sugar as well. The one luxury item was 12 bars of very expensive chocolate. He packed all the food in watertight bags. <clears throat> Only a handful, a handful of brave or foolhardy people attempt to flee the Soviet Union. Most of them use helpful contacts and make elaborate prep preparations. With only meager resources, Alexander kept his plan as elementary as possible. He would simply walk to the border and there, relying on his initiative, try to find a way across. For a guide, he had a standard tourist map. Detailed maps of the area were not available to the public, and he chose not to try to wangle one from the hikers club. It suited his nature to act entirely on his own. Win or lose, no innocent person would be implicated. There were few family ties to hold him. His father, an Air Force pilot, had died of cancer 17 years before. His mother loved him, but he had long ago stopped trying to share his thoughts with her. She took it for granted that Soviet rule was always right. He told her he was going on another long hike and repressing his sorrow hoped that one day they might be able to see each other again. 
As the day of departure drew near, Alexander had to cope with rising apprehension. One complication was the fact that he had surrendered his, his identity papers three weeks before as all Soviet citizens to be exchanged for new ones. Not until Sunday the 18th was he able to pick up his new papers at the local police station. Thank God they haven't learned to read thoughts yet, Alexander mused, as the police finally handed over the papers. If they only knew where I'll be taking this document in a few hours. Late that same night, he left for the railway station, carrying his backpack, some 60 pounds of provisions and equipment, including an air mattress, hunting knife, axe, rope, and an old telescope. He also carried his folding kayak, a patched veteran of a dozen previous trips. The train pulled out shortly before 2 a.m. And for 33 hours in a communal sleeping car, Alexander tried to rest. It was a late morning on the 20th when they arrived in the gloomy Murmansk terminal. Alexander's plan was to take a bus 60 miles southwest to Verkhetnulmoski. I'm sure that was not right. <clears throat> and start his walk from there. But at the bus station, a notice stopped him dead. Verkhetnulmoski was closed except to residents. Whether the decree was meant to lessen the danger of forest fires or as a security measure, it represented a possibly fatal blow to Alexander's plans, since walking there would delay him for far too long. High summer had already finished here above the Arctic Circle, and winter could begin any time. Every day counted, so he risked buying a ticket. To his relief, no one asked to see his identity papers. He boarded the bus which passed the security roadblock without stopping. And in the late afternoon, he arrived. <clears throat> From a 1977 camping trip to the Kola Peninsula, Alexander knew that less than a mile from Verkut Nul Mosky was a huge reservoir, Lake Knot, that stretches halfway to the Finnish border. This was his target. Reaching a deserted stretch of the reservoir at 6 p.m., Alexander began assembling his 15-foot kayak. Two hours later, all preparations were done. He got into the kayak and quietly paddled out toward the deep water. About a half mile from the shore, he stopped paddling to listen. No one appeared to be following, but for the first time in as many days, he truly began to relax. At last, he was on his way. <clears throat> The long, lonely journey ahead did not daunt him. Ever since joining an outing club at the age of 14, he had been camping on short trips near Moscow during school terms, on distant, sometimes month-long expeditions during summer holidays. He loved nature and liked the freedom of being on his own resources with relatively few orders, rules, and prohibitions. Paradoxically, Alexander had begun as a model Soviet boy believing without question in Marxism-Leninism. For him, as for many Russians in those days, true communism remained a shining goal. But a tidal wave of disillusionment swept over the country after Stalin fell into disrepute, and the idealistic were among the hardest hit. Not, only, not one of Alexander's friends believed any longer in Soviet rule. For himself, it wasn't just disgust with the system's crippling defects and cruelties, the endless consumer shortages, the staggering waste and inefficiency. He simply could not bring himself to live with the suppression of individual initiative. As a high school student, he hated having to parrot the political line that his enslaved, despairing country was the freest and happiest on earth. <clears throat> His friends recognized the lying as clearly as he did, but lost themselves in their private lives. Alexander was unable to stifle his repugnance. He had the kind of personality that hungers for idealism and simply cannot abide deceit. Matters came to a head when he entered Moscow University. Everyone in the physics department belonged to the Young Communist League or to the Communist Party. But Alexander's revulsion for Soviet rule grew so strong that in his fourth year, he resigned from the league, which was an unheard of act. The harassment that ensued finally forced him to leave the university. Now that he had a political file, 
his prospects for successful a successful career were ruined. <clears throat> his only hope, he concluded, was to escape to some place where he could live as an honest man. So on one of his hiking expeditions, he investigated the Crimea. Was there a spot from which one might set out on a 200-mile swim to Turkey? He also cycled along the Latvian coast, looking for a, a way to get a rubber raft or small submarine of his own design into the water for passage to Sweden's Gotland Island. He even considered swimming underwater to some Western ship anchored outside a Soviet port and stowing away. But the manpower and resources, centuries, dogs, huge coastal surveillance radars devoted to the guarding each border made these ideas unfeasible. So for two years, Alexander struggled to keep up with his studies while laboring at odd jobs. Then he managed to re-enroll in the physics department of Moscow University as a result of a feud between the dean and the Communist Party committee chairman in the department. Alexander graduated in January 1979, but all jobs in his discipline were refused him because of his political file. By summer, his dreams of escape had taken concrete shape. Alone in the wild, <clears throat> a pink sun still hung low over the water at 10 p.m. as Alexander paddled his way west on the reservoir. The evening coolness reminded him of what was in store once summer ended in this northern wilderness. He kept going until he was exhausted, pulling into the swampy shore at midnight to rest. The next day, he paddled through his stiffness for 14 hours, hearing nothing but the sounds of nature and an occasional outboard motor. Fishermen, he hoped, from great distances over the water. He was in Lapland, the region comprising northernmost Scandinavia and part of the Kola Peninsula. The shores were heavily forested with spruce and carpeted by thick, pristine moss. But the reservoir, in some areas five miles wide, had become a confusing maze of channels and conduits between islands, which his small scale and inaccurate map did not show. Awakening to heavy rain on August 22nd, Alexander spread a plastic sheet over himself in the kayak. As he passed through a half mile wide arm of water that morning, an unexpected sight turned him rigid. On the North shore was a wire running between two tall poles, a radio aerial. Was it a border patrol outpost? He fumbled for his telescope to examine the huts below the aerial, but saw no one. Setting up his fishing rod as a pretext, he held his breath and began drifting past. An outboard engine barked into life, followed moments by a hoarse shout, is anyone there? With no further hope of avoiding any contact, Alexander peered from under the plastic sheet and saw barely a dozen yards away, the welcome figure of an ordinary friendly fisherman. Early that evening into the, uh, into the evening, the kayak turned into the mouth of the small Kisma River, which runs roughly west from the reservoir. But in four arduous hours, Alexander could make only three miles headway against his swift current. So in the morning, he reconciled himself to leaving the kayak and some of his provisions behind. Heaving the craft up to the bank to where it could not be seen, he covered it with branches. He had badly underestimated the difficulty of the trip hoping to reach the border in three days. Four days had passed and about 50 miles still lay ahead. Nevertheless, the hardy young man took bearings from his compass and set out due west toward the woods. <clears throat> he climbed a series of mountain ridges. The heights offered spectacular views of vast valleys watered by silver gray lakes and rivers. Although pushing himself hard, he covered only nine miles that day. There were no signs of civilization in this region of unspoiled serenity. Toward dusk, he spotted a deer. To Alexander, that was an omen of good luck. His supper that night was lard and cheese. <clears throat> he felt confident enough to build a fire and brew some tea. 
In the next four days, his apprehension swelled in proportion to his approach to the border. In the early evening of August 27, his fifth day on foot, he froze when he came across a deer track that had apparently also been used by man. His skin took on a kind of hypersensitivity. His ears trembled at every sound. Sweating under his pack's weight, Alexander tried to step and breathe as quietly as possible, advancing as if on a reconnaissance patrol. Dusk was falling when at 10 o'clock he climbed a final ridge and from the summit made out a straw-colored thread below. Alexander connected this with a barely perceptible rumble. <clears throat> the sound must have been a truck, for the thread was a road, and he wondered where it ran. Deciding to risk nothing more in the dark, he found a hollow under a fallen tree, and despite the unsolved riddle of the road, fell fast asleep. A time to think. Perhaps it was an instinct to accumulate needed energy that allowed Alexander to sleep until 9 a.m. He ate some chocolate, hid his things, and cautiously started down the hill. The straw-colored ribbon gradually grew into a sandy road. Stopping to use his telescope, he saw a fence running along the road's far side. <clears throat> his first thought at the site was, I'll make it. Just how, I don't know, but I'm going to get across. As he crept farther down the hill, the fence became an increasingly formidable obstacle, although less so, he supposed, than in inhabited latitudes. Its eight-foot-high poles supported dozens of strands of barbed wire glinting with newness. Another half-dozen strands were fixed to the three-foot crossbars on top. He inched closer. Zones like this, every Russian knows, are under surveillance by sentries and radar or electronic sensors. But he had to take the risk, hoping the wild remoteness of the place might reduce the measures for guarding it. Apart from a faint wind in the trees, nothing moved or made a sound. From behind a rock some 20 yards short of the road, Alexander saw the barbed wire was attached to the poles with small rectangular pieces of black plastic probably insulators. That could mean the fence was electrified. Two wires touched simultaneously would send a signal to the nearest sentry post. Just beyond the road was a strip of sand two yards wide, level, clean, with fresh rake marks showing. Any step here would leave an unmistakable footprint. How else could the fence be reached? Perhaps from that bridge of logs? Not far away, the road crossed a small stream that flowed beneath the fence. But the water was too shallow to allow even a child to crawl under. Moreover, beyond the fence, a massive log blocked the water route altogether. For a quarter of an hour, Alexander surveyed the scene with his telescope. The absence of any immediate threat gave him courage. Leaving his pack behind the rock, he stepped into the knee-deep stream to approach the road. The water might at least keep his scent from any dogs. He trod only on clean rocks so as not to leave any visible marks on the channel bottom. In the stream just in front of the bridge was a stack of fragile dead spruce treetops. A broken branch would be a glaring signal to guards trained to look for it. With great care, he skirted the pile of branches and stepped onto the bridge to study the fence in detail. So much sand had been shoveled in beyond the bridge, he noted, that the stream almost disappeared from sight. Leaving the bridge, he wiped his boot prints from the slight film of slime on the logs and then stepped back into the water. Careful as he'd been, he nonetheless saw a broken branch in the stack. He smeared the pale broken ends with clay from the stream bottom and then moved on, not leaving the water until he was 200 yards upstream. In the cover of the woods, he followed the fence south to see if another stream offered a better opportunity. From time to time, he stole out to inspect the road. By it, at one point, he saw a strange, intriguing apparatus. Two wooden stakes supported a hat-like device from which two wires ran into the ground, while on a pole, a nearby loudspeaker pointed along the fence. Was it a siren? 
In mid-afternoon, while Alexander was still looking for a better crossing place, the faint rumble of the evening resumed. He hid behind a rock. The sound grew slightly louder. It might never have been recognizable, but for some accompanying creaks, which the hiker identified as those of a bouncing truck body. Soviet trucks normally send out a raucous roar. The special mufflers attached to this one were obviously powerful, but their effect was canceled by the loud creaks. The blunt nose of the truck appeared among the trees. <clears throat> Alexander held his breath as it passed within 50 yards of him, proceeding very slowly. Through his telescope, he made out a platoon of border guards under the canvas at the back, surveying the roadsides and the strip of sand. The truck crawled forward and disappeared around a bend, and suddenly all sound ceased. They must have stopped at the bridge. The silence was suffocating. In fear and acute despair, the fugitive strained to hear something, anything. After 20 minutes, he almost surrendered to the urge and go see what the soldiers were doing, but still he waited. And 10 minutes later, the truck sounds resumed, only to fade away into the distance. <clears throat> Had the soldiers seen something suspicious at the bridge? Or were they merely carrying out routine maintenance of its sand and branches? Shaken, he tried in vain to analyze the situation. It was some time before he allowed himself to leave his hiding place. <clears throat> Late that afternoon, in a dip at the side of the hill, not visible from the road, Alexander sat down to think. Since the fences didn't look utterly impassable, he decided he would attempt to cross it. Just as when wrestling with physics problems, he sat quietly and let his unconscious work. Finally, a solution came to him. He sawed down two saplings and trimmed them, each providing a 13-foot pole. Spruce, rather than pine, of course, because pine snaps too easily. Placing the thick ends on the ground about 18 inches apart, he rested the upper ends on a crossbar, another sawed-off sapling tied between the two trees at the exact height of the fence. With this rungless ladder, he intended to hurdle the barrier. Now, wearing his backpack, he tried scrambling and shinning his way up. The contrivance was awkward, but it might work. Although it was growing dark, he kept on rehearsing and refining the details. The closer he approached to the imminent test, the greater his excitement. At last, he composed himself enough to sleep. Up and over. Alexander awoke on August 29th, so tense he had a sensation of floating without terrestrial weight. The entire course of his life would be decided within the next few hours. Pulling on his hip boots, he ate two bars of chocolate and then carried his backpack and two poles down the hillside to the stream. <clears throat> the trees and ferns around him seemed to stand out more clearly than ever before. His mouth was unbearably dry and his heart seemed to be trying to escape from his chest, yet he felt strong. As a boy, he had always tried to carry the heaviest knapsack. Laboring on construction sites during his university summers, he'd won bonuses and prizes by driving himself to work harder and longer than others. Today, his body moved as, it, as if endowed with higher powers. Checking ahead, he saw nothing out of the ordinary, so he picked up his backpack and poles, stepped into the water, and slowly lugged the awkward load downstream, trying to maintain balance while picking each step on a clean, non-slippery rock. Sweat gushed from his body. Only his new strength allowed him to advance without stopping every few yards to rest. It took even greater strength and finesse to get around the protective pile of treetops without breaking a twig. Once on the bridge, he left his pack at the far side and returned for the poles. His boot prints were glaringly obvious on the damp logs. He crawled back to rub them out. His watch showed 11.45. <clears throat> His observations of the previous day suggested that the border guards made four rounds a day. In the early morning, 10 a.m., 4 p.m., and in the evening, examining the fence, the strip of sand, 
<clears throat> and the telltale dead branches. Alexander had heard the 10 a.m. truck while moving his things downstream. Presumably, he had several clear hours ahead. And even so, from one second to the next, he imagined a squad of guards appearing. He jammed the thicker ends of his poles between bridge logs. The far ends leaned against two adjacent strands of barbed wire on the crossbar atop the fence. He tested for solidity. Then he put on his backpack and looked around. The whole of his life seemed a preparation for this one moment. He began shinning up the poles. Almost immediately, he was looking down at the sand. If successful, he would leave it clean of even a fingerprint, but one false move, and it would be indelibly and disastrously marked. Every fiber of every nerve concentrated on his balance before the next pull upward. He seemed suspended in space and time. In several minutes, Alexander worked his way up to within a yard of the fence top. He placed his quilted jacket on the crossbar wires to protect himself from the barbs. Then he hoisted himself up and almost fell as the crossbar tipped under his weight. An acrobat's balance was required to save the frightened climber. Yet his body provided the correct shift of weight the way it had provided everything until now, as if on higher command. He slowly stood up and suddenly an absurd comic vision came to him. To an approaching border, he would look like a bird perched on a wire. Alexander slipped off his heavy backpack, again almost falling, and dropped it into the stream beyond the barrier. Balancing carefully, he raised each pole in turn, trailed the lower end through the water, <clears throat> and then lifted it over the fence and replaced it in the stream on the other side. The crossbar was too shaky to risk a jump. He had to go down the way he had come up, on all fours. From the far side, after pulling down the poles, he looked back. The only visible evidence of anyone besting the fence was a deep sagging of the wires where his hurdle had rested. He stood on the top at the bottom of the fence to reach up and adjust them and was startled by an electric shock. Insulated by rubber boots and the quilted jacket, he had felt no shocks when climbing. Alexander straightened the wires so they would not appear, so they would appear undisturbed. Finally, he wiped his boot marks from the log and the banks. Then, backpack on again, he tiptoed 10 yards downstream and holding the poles like javelins, threw them as far as he could into a grove of birch trees. It was shortly past noon, but it seemed 20 days rather than 20 minutes since he'd struggled onto the bridge. Race against time. <clears throat> it was not, he was not yet in the clear. Some 400 yards further west, he came to a neglected second fence. He had no trouble pulling out a wooden stake that propped sagging, deeply rusted wires and then pushing himself through the gap. But as he rose from his instinctive crouch, Alexander saw further danger, the top of a watchtower. He fell to the ground, crawled to the nearest trees, and then, under their cover, got up and hurried onward. In five minutes, he came to a swift flowing stream. Plunging in, he pushed himself through the cold water until it joined a second stream. He sloshed against the current for, for a considerable distance. Then he doubled back on land, deliberately leaving footprints that would confuse any pursuer before returning to the water and ultimately continuing west. An hour passed, <clears throat> hearing no bark, no siren, no shouts or shots, the fugitive felt a degree of relief. The immediate peril, at least, was sharply reduced. It was a warm day with a turquoise sky, and Alexander now took pleasure in the beauty of his surroundings. Sparkling streams flowed from wooded hills. Within three hours, he saw five herds of deer. I'm in Finland. The thought kept returning to him, and waves of euphoria surged through him. He walked until midnight, the last two hours by flashlight, through difficult marshes. Still, he could not entirely relax. If his crossing was discovered, there would be search patrols. In any case, he must avoid being seen. The Finnish police, he had heard, <clears throat> under the intimidating shadow of their powerful neighbor, 
return any Soviet citizen who illegally crosses the border. Alexander, therefore, planned to walk roughly 130 miles, traversing some of Europe's most difficult terrain all the way across Finland to Sweden. The threat of apprehension was more immediate than he imagined. Within hours of his crossing, an Australian tourist had reported seeing a bearded hiker with a backpack who looked strange. Finnish police immediately began hunting the suspicious person. A second and possibly lethal handicap was that half the food supply he'd allotted for his trek through Finland was already gone. Nevertheless, Alexander decided he must eat enough to keep going at a normal pace. So in the morning, he had his usual breakfast of bread and lard. At this latitude in September, two or three days could spell the difference. An early snowfall would destroy the berries that were an important part of his diet. He would simply have to push every day to the limit. Apart from a few minutes in the early afternoon to eat his main meal, he spent 14 hours walking at a steady gait under his leaden pack, struggling to stay upright as he forded dozens of swift rivers. One grueling day merged into another. Alexander escaped monotonous reality by recalling arguments and discussions with fellow Russians, conjuring up images of former girlfriends, and by playing favorite Stravinsky and Shostakovich records in his head. On the fourth day in Finland, rain soaked him to the skin. At noon, he came upon a major north-south highway, which he crossed only after scouting it like a gorilla would. At 9 p.m., a canyon presented 200 yards of sheer drop. Though dead tired, he forced himself on. After a punishing descent, he had to cross a river and then drag himself up the far cliff on all fours, gasping and sweating despite the cold, feeling his remaining energy drain away at every stab for a foothold. At the top, he ate a slice of lard on a crust of bread and fell asleep without making a fire. When a major river confronted him the next day, (laughs) Alexander felt a twinge of futility. Too exhausted to chop down a stout branch for a walking stick, which was essential for balance on the crossing, he scanned the bank for the first suitable piece of wood. In his days of fatigue, he did not even test it for strength. As he left the bank, the water pushed up to his hips, making it impossible to resist the mighty current. To get across, he had to jump from boulder to boulder with the help of a stick. Just as he reached the middle of the river, the stick snapped. Without it, he missed his next jump, fell, and was quickly swept downstream. In seconds, his backpack would fill with water and drag him to the bottom but taking it off would mean losing all his supplies and equipment. Frantic, Alexander tore off one shoulder strap and used his free arm to fight the water's deadly sweep. He finally managed to grab something. With a shout of triumph, he dragged himself like a ferocious animal to the western bank. Wringing out his outer clothes, (laughs) he kept shivering. The water had been freezing. He was in a state of shock. Yet after only a few minutes rest, he pressed on. He was too cold to sleep. And in any case, he could not afford the luxury of stopping before 10 or 11 p.m. Sober calculation, not bravado, compelled Alexander to maintain his desperate pace. His cheese was gone, as was his bread. Now breakfast and dinners were whatever berries he could find with a mouthful or so of lard until that too was finished. When he lit a fire, he would brew some tea, but this luxury was usually reserved for night stops. As the days grew noticeably shorter, the leaves turned gold before his very eyes, graphic confirmation of his race against time. Like a migrating animal, he was gripped with a panic to keep moving. Alexander's instincts were right, but for a reason he didn't suspect, The search launched after the Austrian tourist report was fully underway. From other sightings, Finnish police knew Alexander's approximate route. 
yet they were constantly three days behind him because they didn't believe a hiker could walk 14 hours a day, day after day, over this terrain. <clears throat> Eerie vastness. For Alexander, nature had become a diabolical persecutor. He had reached a lost world of infinite marshes and swamps, a nightmarish 40 miles into the middle of Finland. Swampy pools stretch from horizon to horizon with a sponge-like nettings of moss topped with roots covering their dank water. When Alexander trod on this treacherous crust, water would spurt out in all directions. If one of his feet broke through, he might well disappear forever. But there was no other way west. His only hope was to tread carefully and pray. Streams and rivulets watered the gigantic marsh like capillaries. Along their edges, thicker roots made the going slightly easier. Deer tracks, the water-filled hoof prints standing out as if set in wet concrete, were even safer to follow. But most of Alexander's route left him on his own, crossing huge, soggy patches. At a second's delay on any step, the roots began to give way. Fetid marsh gas bubbled up. Little waves lapped outward. Alexander yearned to run, but with water up to his knees, it was impossible. His compromise was an odd gait in which, as if to match the unreality of his surroundings, he lifted his legs high and quickly, a bizarre figure entering the heartland of a bizarre kingdom. At places where he stopped, because it seemed impossible to go on, and yet impossible return. His legs performed a kind of jig, as if seeking the steps for walking on water. <clears throat> the colossal expenditure of energy utterly exhausted him. But at the most difficult moments, he felt the same exhilaration he'd experienced when climbing the fence at the border. Again, he was being tested to the limit. Would his luck hold? or would he drown without a trace? He had no thought, thought apart from how to stay up on the next step. And after each step, he felt the joy of Russian, a Russian roulette player hearing the clamor, hammer click on an empty pistol chamber. When he finally reached the edge <clears throat> of this vast man trap, small mountains blocked his way. He was alone in an eerie vastness with no living thing <clears throat> apart from grass, no tree, no sound, and such a gaunt emptiness that he fell into a deep depression. Maintaining his will to push on in the blackness was a matter of moral as well as physical endurance. Coming upon a sandy road, the first sign of civilization in more than two days, he followed it, <clears throat> even though it led more to the south than to the west. People built this road, an inner voice told him. Keep on it and you'll see a human being. The thought cheered him until he spotted fresh footprints and some mud. The bark of a dog drove him back into the wilderness. He had risked everything to cross the border. It would be madness to gamble now, to chance being reported. Making his way down a river the next day, he caught, the sight, uh, caught sight of a hunter's cabin on the opposite bank. He crossed the river further downstream, returned and approached the hut with extreme caution. The door was barred on the outside. No one was there. He stepped inside. The date of the last entry in the cabin's guest book was in early August. So the season must be long over and Alexander succumbed to a deep yearning to rest the night there. If anyone appeared, he would try to pass himself off as an American tourist the strong, silent type. Although he had studied English at school, his knowledge of the spoken language came entirely from BBC and Voice of America broadcast. The stove was as tempting as anything in the cozy room. He greased a pan with his lard and mixed all his dough, which had been intended for fish bait, with baking soda he found in the cabin. When the dough rose, he baked a thick pancake a culinary masterpiece. He violated his vow to save half for the following day. <clears throat> he was too exhausted to sleep well. But when he left the cabin the next morning, Alexander felt mentally stronger. 
the pancake was already a cherished memory. Half a dozen fishing attempts had produced nothing, so he committed his rod to the bottom of a pond. With his food almost gone, he felt dangerously weak. Limbs struggled against willpower. His body kept go going only by shifting to a kind of emergency power. A state in which no superfluous movements were made and no bits of energy wasted. Huckleberries and cloudberries were his main source of food. Seeing some, he would drop his pack, get down on his hands and knees, and wearily pick the berries and eat them. They were delicious, but with the season almost over, there were never enough for him to eat his fill. At times, he would stoop to pick just two or three. An instinct for self-preservation allowed him to detect, as if by radar, a single berry in a thicket of leaves. <clears throat> with the sickly emptiness in his stomach and his ears constantly buzzing, even the thought of food became remote. He became detached from reality. At the sight of a mushroom, he had to force himself to pick and save it. Eating mushrooms was a danger he accepted simply to get something in his stomach. He fried them in an old pan he'd found. They left him slightly nauseated, but less empty. Oh, he saw deer and envied their ability to eat grass. If I could somehow catch a deer, he thought, I would eat its flesh immediately. But he had no means and therefore no hope. The determination that kept him going hung by a thread. Late in the afternoon of September 8th, he dragged himself to the top of a mountain ridge and saw a gray strand of road in the distance. The road promised the salvation of the Swedish border. Just when he felt he was finished, he promised himself not to sleep before reaching it. Hard rivers remained to be crossed. He ate his inviolable reserve of the last two bars of chocolate and set off at six o'clock. The moon rose at 11. It was well after midnight when at last he staggered to the road. But he could find no signs of the Muyono River that establishes the border. Picking around the roadside in the moonlight, he found candy wrappings and empty beer cans. Three labels of four read, made in Sweden. Yet the bridges on the road, constructed exactly like all the others he'd seen in Finland, convinced himself he was still in that country. With no idea where the border lay, the failed expectation after this last push seemed the final blow. Oasis of warmth. In the morning, Alexander's leg muscles trembled from weakness. Now he carried out a bitter decision to leave his major equipment, including saw, hip boots, flashlight, and air mattress hidden in a bag near the road. He simply could not carry them any longer. When every remnant of willpower had to be summoned just to put down one foot after the other, he made progress on some relatively easy sand west of the road with no idea he was heading into the arm of Northern Finland that juts into Norway. <clears throat> It was a mistake that could take him 40 miles further into marshland and mountain ranges. Then from a slight rise, his telescope showed that a huge marsh, marsh stretch ahead to the horizon. It was another stunning disappointment. Lacking the strength to cross such difficult terrain, he had nearly run out of options. A memory penetrated his despair and he returned to a north-south track he had crossed hours earlier that afternoon. Through a cold drizzle and strong wind, he chose to trudge northward along the track, crossing the most barren country of his entire route. That night, he gathered branches to sleep on, covering so himself with his jacket and a plastic sheet. When he awoke, it took 30 minutes of exerting what was left of his willpower to drag himself off into the icy rain. And where do I go now? He asked himself, what more can I do? He lurched forward on the track. He'd only eaten mushrooms for supper and nothing for breakfast. His backpack was almost in shreds. He himself was gaunt and disheveled. He wondered how much longer he would be able to continue. 
The train was not only empty, but pitiless. For the first time, Alexander realized that he might die unknown and unnoticed. The meaninglessness of it appalled him. So although the slightest incline, incline now made him breathless, he promised himself he would keep moving for two more hours. One hopeless hour passed and he felt dizzy. Suddenly he stopped. His tired eyes made out rooftops and a sizable radio aerial a few hundred yards ahead. Peering through his telescope, he saw several single story wooden buildings, apparently part of a compound. The largest aerial made him think it might be a border outpost with Norway, but he knew he had come quite far north. Fearfully, he shuffled up to one house and knocked. Moments later, he found himself welcomed by the Finnish householder with a room into a room of unbelievable warmth. On the table, piles of bread, butter, ham, salami, and cheese surrounded a pot of steaming coffee. The weakened traveler tried not to show he hadn't eaten for days. <clears throat> Forcing himself to look away from the table, he carefully pronounced the rehearsed words in English. I am American tourist and I little get lost. May I see map, please? One of the neighbors at the table produced an excellent map and pointed out their location. Alexander was up in the little west thrusting peninsula of Finland he'd forgotten about. The nearness of the food made him feel faint as he studied the map, its marking and its colors swam before his eyes. A woman appeared, the wife of a Helsinki theatrical director who was there on holiday. She poured the new arrival a cup of coffee and made a help yourself gesture toward the food. Alexander tried to eat his salami sandwich so as not to betray his hunger. He eyed the men, hesitated, and then bolted a second sandwich. When the woman passed him a large huckleberry pie, it was all he could do to cut a slice and not devour all of it. <clears throat> when the effects of the splendid food had eased his faintness, another worry, a worry overtook Alexander. Surely the Helsinki couple was finding it hard to believe he was American. His clothes were ragged, his hands raw. Maybe they took him for a tramp. He hoped so. But when he followed the wife to the kitchen where she prepared food for him to take with him, she noticed the empty backpack and gave him a searching look. What if she signaled the men and they called the police? Instead, she kept staring at him with obvious curiosity, as if she would have liked to ask a few questions. At last, she turned away and in silence stuffed bread, sugar, tea, and two packages of goulash into little bags for him. He left feeling newly fit, like an empty car refueled. When he stopped a few hours later to sample the goulash, a wave of tingly warmth radiated from his lips to his toes. Alexander's route was back down to the same track some 20 miles to the border village of Kutainen. Far from regretting the day lost by taking the track that went north, he realized this had saved him. As much as food he had needed, the information, human contact, and the psychological push to lift him out of his treacherous spiral of despair. Once again, his luck is held. That is, if the people at the compound had not alerted the police. He decided not to approach the border until the following day. Making camp early, he laid down at 6 p.m. and slept for 16 hours. When the track broadened into a road the next morning, he at first tried to hide at the sound of every passing car. But the total absence of any attention paid to him made him bold enough to walk to the outskirts of Kutainen. The Sw Swedish half of the little village was right there across the river, but Alexander saw no bridge. As he walked along the border road, checking the river for crossing places, a young driver picked him up and took him into a ferry landing on the neighboring town of Curaçoando. The sight gave the little ferry on the Swedish the sight of the little ferry on the Swedish bank gave Alexander courage to enter the customs office <clears throat> and ask whether it would make another trip that day. An officer said yes, it would return in five minutes, and no, there was no charge for pedestrians. Alexander dared not ask about identity checks, but to his further relief and amazement, when the little ferry did return, he observed that there were no checks on people making the crossing. No one was even questioned. He boarded the craft, and in minutes, and in the minutes before he left, 
felt a calmness that he had not enjoyed for years. As the ferry cast off and began churning for Sweden, he, su he succumbed to a moment of something like happiness. Providence had truly blessed his trip, providing rescue in every crisis. Then from the corner of his eye, he saw a dark, unmarked car tear to the landing stage on the finish side. It sped straight to the gate with a sense of urgency and authority that he thought could only belong to the police. As, the, as Alexander watched in dismay, the driver got out, waved his arms, and the ferry began turning back. So his musings had been premature, the self-congratulations of a fool. He dropped his guard, and now it seemed unbelievable that he had been discovered and would fail after coming within a hundred yards of his goal. He rushed to the ferry's rail. If necessary, despite his weakness, he would swim for it. Preparing to jump, Alexander tried to focus on the figure at the landing stage. And then he, re he realized it was no policeman, just an ordinary driver frantic because he had missed the boat. The ferry docked and took him on, and this time Alexander held his breath as they cast off and kept his mind free of any congratulations. He was right to hold his breath. <clears throat> Among the passengers who had gotten off the ferry in Chris Suendo as Alexander was getting on was a Finnish soldier who surmised the bearded hiker was the one the police were searching for. He hastened to report his sighting. But once more, luck and good timing had saved Alexander. <clears throat> In a matter of minutes, the ferry had crossed to Sweden. Everything there seemed unpressured and easygoing and therefore incredible. Soon the young Russian would write to a new friend that the sense of freedom exhilarates me constantly in my new life. After 23 days on the road from Moscow, Alexander was free. No longer was he the creature of his former rules. Now he belonged to himself. Three days after landing in Sweden, Alexander arrived in Stockholm, where he was granted political asylum. When people referred to his trek as an, extra, an act of extraordinary courage, he shrugged it off, calling himself just an ordinary guy. While making arrangements for immigration to the United States, he resumed his studies, including independent research at Stockholm's Institute of Theoretical Physics. He came to the United States in April 1980. He was granted a research assistantship at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, getting his uh, PhD in theoretical physics in June of last year. Today, he is happily settled at the University of Wisconsin in Madison as a postdoctoral research associate. His English is now impeccable, and he still enjoys a good hike from time to time. What a story, and Merry Christmas, Mom.